Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list. Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK, well maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs. A dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? 
No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, we certainly have a busy day ahead of us, so let's get started, shall we? You'll find a map of the museum with the itinerary I've just handed out. The museum's our first port of call, so uh, let's have a look at the map now. The door on the right of the entrance hall leads into the gift shop and ticket centre. Once we pick up our entrance tickets, I'd ask everyone to deposit their bags and coats in the cloakroom, which is located towards the back of the gift shop and ticket centre. If you want to pick up an information leaflet, you can approach the information desk situated along the right-hand side. Now, once you come back into the entrance hall, the door on the opposite side to the gift shop leads into the art gallery. There is a special exhibition on there at the moment which is not to be missed. If you continue on up the entrance hallway, that leads into the main exhibition centre. At the back left-hand side, there are some toilets. Beside the toilets, you'll find the 3D theatre. I strongly recommend that you make time for the 30-minute presentation in the theatre. It is well worth a viewing. Running along the right-hand side of the main exhibition centre is the Modern Art Studio. Here, not only can you view some of the most famous works of the 20th century, but you can also sit in on a workshop run by a local artist. So, that's the Art Museum. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next on the itinerary is the aquarium. Depending on how long we spend at the museum, we might have to give this one a miss. It's not what I'd call a highlight of the day, but it would be a shame if we didn't get to see it, as it's en route to the Solheim Country Club, where we're booked in for lunch at one o'clock. Originally, we had planned to stop off at the Milltown Winery afterwards, but we've had to scrap that plan, otherwise we'd never get to the zoological gardens before closing time. We have pre-booked the gardens and must be there by 2.30, so no dilly-dallying please after lunch. Straight back onto the bus. The gardens close at 3.30, so we've an hour there which should give us ample time to look around. Time allowing, we'll stop off at the famous Stout Brewery after that, if traffic isn't too heavy, and we're in Lincoln before 5. If not, we'll head straight for the National Concert Hall, where you're in for a real treat of an evening, with a performance from the world-renowned cellist Andre Borowski. We have to be in our seats by 6.30 sharp. 
After that, it's back to the hotel for the night, where a buffet meal will be waiting for us at half eight, or whenever we get back. That is the end of part two. Part three. Part three. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Okay, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic: wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional because I don't see it on the requirements list. Okay, we should start planning our class presentation since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation. Anyhow, the books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Right. Okay. I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first, we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually, those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt, or worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. Okay, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box, a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary, and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right, and we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly, because those things just stress the bird. Yes, 
It's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. Okay, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second lecture in our series on animal senses. Today, I'll be comparing the sensory systems of different species and discussing how these senses enable them to explore their environment. When it comes to the sense of smell, you may think that human beings have powerful and well-evolved sensory systems. However, some animals have a sense of smell that is far more powerful than ours. Dogs, for example, have a sense of smell that is 40 times greater than a human's and can distinguish 220 kinds of smell. Some animals can even smell odours that are undetectable by the human nose, such as carbon dioxide. There are also animals that have a relatively weak sense of smell. For example, there are species of beetles that can recognise the odours of certain plants but not others. The bee is an interesting example to examine in reference to smell because they experience this sense via their antennae. Bumblebees have stings, but it's rare that they actually use this weapon. When a bee feels threatened, it will use its legs to signal and warn others about the threat before it stings. This is called a signaling posture and involves the bee lifting its two back legs into the air. Within any hive, there is a hierarchy with the queen bee at the top. The queen bee is able to control the colony by monitoring its movement through her feet. The queen bee is the only reproductive female in the entire colony, and she is also able to sting multiple times, unlike the worker bees that will die if they sting. In the insect world, scent can also be used to facilitate mating, as females decide whether or not to mate with a male, depending on the quality of his scent. One such example of this is the female butterfly, who will only mate with the male butterfly that produces the strongest pheromones. This is how the species ensures that only the best genes are perpetuated in order to create the strongest offspring. Next we move on to the hearing sense of beetles. Interestingly, beetles do not have ears, but instead use their feet to detect vibrations caused by sound. This is particularly useful when searching for food among the trees in which they live, as they are able to detect the location and movement of their prey by monitoring vibrations in the woodlands. The final sense that we'll be looking at today is sight. Snakes are a particularly interesting case study, as they do not see shapes and colours as humans do, but instead hunt their prey by detecting the heat radiating from their mouths. This makes them incredibly effective predators, as they are able to zero in on their prey very quickly and efficiently. From a distance, a snake is able to locate the heat radiating from a mouse, for example, and upon moving closer, will be able to determine its body shape. 
This can help prevent the snake from attempting to attack prey that is too large for it. Once a snake has killed and eaten its prey, it goes into a state of hibernation, whereby all of its energy is directed towards digesting the food stored in its stomach. Depending on the size of the snake and its prey, this hibernation can last from hours to days. Once fully fed, a large snake will not need to eat again for the next couple of weeks. During the breeding season, however, female snakes will feed more frequently. The heat detection of a snake is very complex and can be even more effective than the vision of a human. It not only uses heat to determine the location of its prey, but before it commits to hunt, it will also use the heat to calculate how much distance it has to travel in order to reach it. This prevents the snake from wasting energy hunting prey that is too far away to catch. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.